Until now, we have learned how to price a derivative with different numerical techniques. Now is the time to discuss the concept of hedging, which is also very important. In this lecture, we will concentrate on different uh, calculations of uh, sensitivities. So once we have a model, model, and this model has a number of parameters, we would like to learn what is the impact of your price of derivative to particular parameter and how to perform a hedging experiment. So this means once we sell or buy a derivative, how would you hedge this derivative until the maturity of the contract? What is the impact? Where actually you can make money, how you can make money by selling a derivative? Let's take a look at uh, uh, the content of today's lecture. So first we start with a uh, hedging with the black source model. Uh, I will show you uh, main principles. We also go through experiment where we will be talking about a simulation of PNL, so profit and loss. Uh, obviously, everyone would like to have always profit, but in uh, terms of derivative pricing, we also have to look at losses and what are the drivers for losses. Um, then we will move to a, a Python experiment where we will talk about dynamic hedging. So hedges, hedges we can do in a hedges depend on frequency. We can do them frequently. It's called dynamic uh, hedging. We can do it statically once. So, for example, we do it only once in a while. In this experiment, we will concentrate on a continuous hedging. This means we will do it almost every day or every minute, the hedge, and we will see what is the impact of the hedging frequency on our profit and loss. Uh, then, uh, next point would be uh, impact of jumps and hedging. So, what happens if we have a process which has jumps, however, we hedge without using jumps? So, that would be very interesting to see can we actually make money or we can lose money? And that will be also presented in this experiment. Uh, then the next points will be concentrated on, uh, um, this point will be about the delta, uh, gamma and vega. So um, until now, and also in the first lectures, we talk about the delta hedges, how to perform, uh, how to construct a replicating portfolio, how to get your delta sensitivity. However, there are much more sensitivities like uh, gamma or vega, for example, or even much more, there's plenty of them. Uh, in this uh, section, we will talk about uh, what are the differences between them and how to use them once you buy or sell certain derivative. Uh, then we have a, a block consisting of three elements. Uh, those three elements are focusing on uh, uh, Monte Carlo simulation and calculation of sensitivities. So if you have a model which is given in closed form, like Black Scholes, the sensitivities to all the parameters are given in closed form. However, question is what happens how to calculate your sensitivities once you don't have closed form solution for your price, but you have uh, only, let's say, Monte Carlo simulated paths. How can you calculate sensitivities to model parameters? Also, if you talk about delta, delta is sensitivity to your initial stock. So how to calculate the impact on a change of the stock value and impact on the derivative value. So that's basically, those are the three elements. And here we have a finite difference. So very uh, intuitive, straightforward approach to calculate sensitivities using uh, finite difference, so-called so bumping or shocking approach. And then we have a two more advanced techniques, pathwise, pathwise sensitivities and likelihood ratio method. So those are the methods which uh, require additional knowledge. So if you know something more about the model of use, you can use this information in these two techniques to calculate your sensitivities, and that will help you to get better convergence and also faster results. The concept of hedging is as important as derivative pricing. Once we talk about uh, fair value, it is always associated with a price of hedging. It may be a little bit counterintuitive that you could say that hedging is uh, actually determines the value of a derivative, but this is how it works in practice. Once you think about uh, financial institutions that um, sells a, a product, a derivative, um, essentially, if we would hedge all the risks, if this institution would hedge all the risks uh, through the lifetime of the contract, the hedging would completely offset the value of a derivative. So typically, price of a hedge determines the value of a derivative. This is maybe a little bit of counterintuitive because you could think, okay, so if I sold a derivative and I hedged all the risk, and at the end, those two things are the same, this means I have gained zero. And that is indeed the, 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 the true, that the price of a hedge 
is equivalent with the price of a market value of a derivative. So the question is, where is the money? How actually financial institutions make money? Financial institutions make money uh, in the additional premium that is put on the top of a value. So if we have a fair value of uh, some exotic derivative, then there is additional spread, so-called spread, put on the top. And that spread is basically a profit for a financial institution. And the rest, the value of a fair value of a derivative, it will be offset completely by the hedging procedure. So um, today we, I will show you this experiment, uh, uh, first some background and how the hedging can be done in a case of a black scholes model. In practice, we would have much more involved models, uh, for example, Heston model, uh, where volatility is stochastic, that completely complicates, um, the, fully complicates the, the procedure of hedging. But I think here, this example on how to do the hedging and also experiment that will be performed later on, I think it will well illustrate the process of uh, uh, making no money essentially because profit and loss that we have from this strategy would be essentially zero on average so um, we start with a uh, with equation that we already have seen many many lectures ago so this is the we build a portfolio replicating portfolio that will consist of a, a derivative a value of a derivative it's with plus because we are seller we sold an option so we received at time t uh, this amount and we have a minus delta s. Like I said already before, whether it's a plus or minus delta here, it doesn't really matter. Once we derive this uh, uh, delta, it naturally would include either minus or plus, depending on uh, uh, on this value here. But for um, just to keep in mind, for clear uh, for uh, transparency, we will use just a minus, so we know that we gained this value and we lost a little bit here. So we're kind of offsetting the value of the derivative. This delta is determined in the way that the portfolio, the whole delta or sensitivity of a portfolio to stock, it's zero. This means that if a value, if a stock goes up or down, and the, this will be, will be represented even in a value of this derivative. So if we have a call or put option, once stock moves, the value of a call or put would change. And then in order to hedge that risk, we need to buy or sell certain amount of stocks. If, for example, you have an out-of-the-money option, which is not so sensitive to movements of a stock, stock, however, you have a lot of stocks, obviously you are overhedged. This means you are um, basically not really hedging the risk that you have. You are carrying even more risk because you have more stocks than you're supposed to. So choosing proper delta, uh, it is very important. Delta is always based on a model. So keep always in mind that once you choose a model, then you need to always think of a uh, delta that will correspond to a model. Uh, once we talk about option prices like calls and puts, this will be associated with a Black-Scholes delta. If you talk about uh, stochastic volatility models and maybe some more complicated payoffs, then this delta will have a different meaning. So delta, it's always sensitive of a model to particular change of the, of the stock. So if your stock change, what will be the value effect on your portfolio? So um, maybe you remember when, once we did the ETO derivative, so there was a long process, I think, in the lecture one or two, once we talked about uh, um, uh, dynamics of the portfolio. Uh, but simply, you can say, like I just mentioned, that we are looking for delta such that sensitivity of our replicating portfolio to stock to our underlying asset S is zero. This essentially means that delta has to be equal to uh, derivative of a uh, value of a derivative that you sold, so the sensitivity of a derivative that we have sold to stock. That's basically delta. So this delta essentially will be, will be equal here. So then our replicating portfolio consists of a value of derivative. This value of derivative will, of course, change in time because we are selling derivative today, but there is a maturity, typically some maturity. Team. So over the lifetime of this contract, we have to continuously adjust our delta according to sensitivity of this value of derivative to stock. This is something uh, uh, that is basically this, this expression represents. And you see that it's a times s. So this delta determines how much, how many of the stocks we need to, uh, we can, or we need to buy or sell to have this position hedged. Uh, in uh, in this model, in a uh, Black-Scholes model, in this e experiment, we assume that we can have a fractional stocks. 
So this means we can have a delta, which is half, so we can buy half of a stock. Uh, these days, it is also possible to buy half a stock, so you have a lot of brokerage uh, firms that allow you to buy fractional stocks. Uh, but in the in the past, it was considered a big assumption of the model, but it's not anymore. Typically, once you sell an option that would not be uh, underlying, would not be just a one single stock, but could be hundreds of stocks, then of course this fraction would immediately trans uh, translate to proper um, a number of stocks that have to be used or uh, sold or bought to to hedge the position. So okay, so we have a delta uh, V S, and that is basically uh, the value of our replicating portfolio. So, and what happens, so we now we need to what, what are the next steps. So once we determined what is the hedging strategy, because we only hedge with a delta. So we need to determine what we will do at every time step until the maturity time, T. Uh, something else I would like to add is that if you have a Heston model, for example, then we need to have additional sensitivities depending on uh, variance, because number of deltas you can think of is always um, you always have to hedge all the risk factors that you have in your dynamics. So in Black Scholes model, we have only one risk factor. The market is complete. In Heston model, market is incomplete, and you may you may hedge all the risk factors that you have there. So in more stochastic differential equations you have in the pricing equation, more hedging you have to perform. Always something to um, to keep in mind. Uh, we have two types of hedging. So here we consider dynamic hedging. Uh, dynamic hedging essentially means that we will uh, our frequency once that we will adjust our delta uh, is frequent it's really high frequency so we we will talk about days or even hourly so later we will, I will perform an experiment showing you the impact of the frequency of hedging on your pnl distribution so pnl it's a distribution of a profit and loss so depending on the frequency that could uh, essentially uh, impact your a worst case scenario and best case scenario with determining the fair value of this derivative. Uh, you also, we also have static hedging. So this is dynamic hedging. Static hedging means that we buy or sell derivative only in the beginning or few more times in between today and the maturity. And this static hedging is uh, essentially, uh, it doesn't need to be recomputed very often. Um, it is just a smart choice of hedging such that we always have this delta neutrality without interfering in the uh, the dynamics, without interfering in the re hedging or revaluating our position. As an example of static hedging could be you uh, buy an option from or you sell an option to one counterparty and you buy the same option from other counterparty. It might be similar amount of option. So you see that this could be considered to be uh, uh, static hedging because you have sold derivative and you have bought derivative from different counterparty and then the, those derivatives will be offsetting each other this means that there is no risk you don't need to perform any more hedging and delta hedging however of course in practice would be some differences between those contracts so for example you sold a uh, hundred of options from one counterparty and you bought 105 from other counterparty this means that there is some difference and then you, you may need to do some delta hedging, but that could be less frequent because that would be smaller proportion of the overall portfolio. Okay, so we are looking at the dynamic hedging. So we have a dynamic hedging until maturity time T. So we start at time T0 and until, until the maturity time, we want to perform the hedging. Um, I think in this experiment, we'll just consider European type option. So we have one payment at the maturity. And in between, we only look at the value of a derivative and we look at the delta hedge. So initially, just like in the in the top here, we start with a replicating portfolio that we have a, a value amount of money that we receive from the selling the option, and we have a minus delta t zero is zero. And um, in this case, we essentially you can see that depending on the delta sign, this initial value can be positive or negative, and then this amount of money that we will have initially received or we uh, we are we are on the minus uh, then this amount has to be taken from the money savings account that's typically the procedure so if we have money that's because this hedging strategy here uh, this delta is uh, this amount will be smaller than this amount this means that this overall is positive this difference will be put on the savings account 
that we let it grow with interest rate in. So we consider a constant interest rate in the Black Scholes model. So then we put on the money savings account. If we have negative, we assume also that we would borrow uh, this amount from the savings account. And at the end, at the maturity, we will need to return it. Okay, um, so like I just mentioned, we may have a positive or negative amounts, uh, and especially in the initial phase. And uh, we will also consider the funding account. So this is a PNL. So maybe often you can, uh, you may often hear this uh, expression PNL. It stands for profit and loss. So and is just N, or it's also denoted as such. Uh, PNL tells you, uh, of course, you would like to have positive PNL. PNL tells you that you are making money if it's positive and you're losing money if it's negative. So obviously, we would like to have it positive. But on once we talk about the derivative pricing, in expectation, PNL at the maturity should be zero. Because, like I just mentioned, uh, like I just said, PNL on average uh, should not generate if we sell a derivative and we hedge it. A market is complete. This uh, procedure of hedging of derivative should not generate us extra income. On average, we should just have zero. And if we have made any money, this money should come from the extra spread that we would uh, sell it, put on the top of the value. So, for example, by pricing the derivative, we use Black Scholes model to a counterparty, and uh, price fair value is five, and we are just charging six. That one extra, so six minus five, this extra one will be our profit, but it's only a realized profit once we, at the end, we wait until maturity, we see what happens, and then this one is actually realized profit. And this is how it works in banks also. Banks provide services to other institutions, they sell derivatives, and they continuously hedge those derivatives. And profits are made only on the extra spread, extra premium that is put on the top of the fair value. So once we have a fair value, we just let it hedge until the lifetime of the derivative. And we hopefully we make money only on the premium. If the model, of course, is not properly chosen, there could be a loss. So the premium will not cover all the hedging costs associated with, uh, uh, with a contract. And that's not good. So this is also a reason why it is very important to have a model which properly uh, expresses, properly fits to the market and also uh, is the model assumptions are realistic and uh, um, it model is good enough for pricing of a derivative. Okay, um, then we have uh, uh, the funding account. So like I just said, so the funding account, we call it a PNL, and we will go over the, the time. So we define a grid. We have a time T0, T1, and sorry, T1, T1, T2, and so on until time T. And then we just perform the procedure. And so imagine that initially we have a PNL which is equal to our uh, amount of um, that we have gained from uh, selling an option, plus we have a delta H. So this is our initial PNL, and this can be positive or negative. But whatever value it is, this will grow until next period with a rate uh, R t minus one minus t zero, and this is uh, like I just said. We have initial amount we put on a savings account or we withdraw from a savings account and or we borrow from a bank and this will grow with a rate r t1 to t0 so this is this will grow over this period of time and then of course next period it will once we have pnl at time t1 it will also grow with r t2 minus r t1 so this is kind of iterative process and how, of course, the, the distance between T0 and T1 will depend on the frequency, how often we perform the hedging. Okay, um, so it's time T1, what happens? So once we sold this derivative, we did already hedging. Now we are time uh, T1. So we have a PNL from T0, so this is the initial amount, which grew until time T1 with a rate R times T1 minus T0. So this is a, a time from the previous period until now. And then we have, uh, this is interesting expression, then we have to, we have a minus sign and we have to borrow this amount. So you remember in the initial phase, once we did the first hedging, we had a delta T0 stock. So we had delta T0 times S0. So um, if we waited, this was S time, 
t0. So if we waited until time t1, we have a delta t0, because this was determined at time t0, times s t1. So now, if we look at uh, uh, time t1, if at time t1 we calculate delta of this, our option, because we have to always calculate this option, maybe remember, if we go back, this delta is always derivative of the value of an option that we have sold to stock, current value of a stock. So now, if we, if we have new delta, however, we also have a lot of delta from the previous iteration. So we are only have to buy or sell difference between deltas from time t1, t0, and time t1. So otherwise, if we had, let's say, five stocks at time t0 to hedge, and now we have a delta of six, we don't need to buy extra six, we just have to buy extra one to have in total six. And this is the expression that represents that. So we have a minus, and then we always look incrementally how many stocks we had. So this is key element here is that once we had delta t0 times a zero, in time t1 we have delta t0, because that's fixed at previous time. However, a stock value has changed, so we have a st1. Okay, and now we define grid. So like I just like I just said, we have this uh, time t0 until the maturity. So at m we have a maturity time t. And we have a reoccurring recursive formula. So we have an initial point. We have an iterative point where we always bring the PNL from the previous time step to the next one, and we adjust our delta. So this is just an iterative process. Uh, and then at the end, we have to do something, right? So depending on, uh, because we have sold an option, we wait until maturity, and now we have to check um, what we have, what kind of obligations we have. So if we have a call option, so we sold a call option at the maturity, we don't have any more uh, VT, right? So this we, we had, we had the VT zero at the end. So that's time T, we have a payoff, right? Because now we are at time capital T. So we have to check what is the value that we have to pay uh, to the person who bought it from us, right? So we were writing, we sold it, we get our premium, we, uh, and then we have to, uh, we have obligation. So the, the person who bought it uh, has a right to pawn it, of course, depending on, of course, on the value. So if a stock, we sold an option, what you like to have is that our option, if we sold it, uh, expires worthless. This means that you like to have as a writer that our stock will be below K because then this expression is also is negative. So if you sell a call option, you always wish that at the end of the maturity, there is no extra payment you have to do from the uh, from the maturity of the contract. Of course, if you uh, if the stock increased a lot, so obviously uh, a person who bought this option from us will be very happy because at the end we have to return this T minus K. So a writer of an option, of a call option, always hopes that the stock will go down. If you are a writer of a put option, you always hope that the stock will go up. So we always keep in mind. What you are selling essentially, uh, you are selling a volatility because you sell uncertainty. So if the option is expires worthless. So if you don't do any hedging, for example, and you just sell options, you issue options, you collect all these premiums, you always hope that the option will end up out of the money. So that it's, uh, it's worthless. So person who bought it from you has zero. However, you collected the premium initial value of a derivative. Okay, so what happens at the end? So we have this iterative process. We do the hedging every time step. At the end, we uh, assign Tn. We have a PNL from Tn minus one. Of course, it still grew over previous uh, intervals. So we have a Tm minus Tn minus one. We have a, a value that we have to pay, right? So we have the a person, depending on a, a stock value at the maturity, we need to, uh, we receive before the value of, uh, of a premium. We have to have a, we have to set, we have to pay it, this amount. So best case scenario, it can be zero for us. And of course, because we hedged, we have a delta Tn minus one. So this is the, from the previous iteration, we have this much stocks and we have a plus because we are allowed to sell it. And this is, you can see that if the stock increased a lot, so this delta was one, then uh, the loss that we would have from here, we could cover from this amount. So this is the whole idea. If we sold a call option, a call option increased in value because stock moved a lot, because of the delta hedge, at the end, we should have a high delta uh, TM minus one of stocks. So then we actually cover all the losses that we were associated with this amount. 
On the other hand, if stock went very much down, so the, this value is zero, uh, if we did the proper hedging, this delta would be also close to zero. So at the end, we don't have too much loss from here, we have zero loss from here, but we also don't have benefit from here. So that's the idea of hedging that we always look at the variability, the sensitivity of a value with respect to stock. So if there is not enough, there is not so much sensitivity, we don't have too much stocks in our portfolio. If there is a lot of sensitivity, then we need to have indeed a lot of stocks in order to edge the off to offset this position. Okay, uh, now uh, we have this PNL concept you can see here, and but there is a lot of stochasticity here, right? So you can see that the because we have a stock which is stochastic, this uh, PNL, it is not a constant number; it changes depending on our uh, of stock. And of course, this delta is also changing depending on the value of derivative. And also this is changing. So you see there is uh, some stochasticity in here. And now we are interested what is actually the distribution or what can we say about average PNL? So if we do this procedure of hedging, like we just described here, for all the Monte Carlo paths that we simulated, what is the distribution of PNL? Or what is the expected value at least? What can we say about that? Uh, what we would expect, essentially, so this is something I mentioned, is that if we, uh, if cost of hedging is equivalent with a derivative value of a derivative, then we would ex the expectation of a PNL to be equal to zero. So it's a mar martingale. So it just always stays zero. Uh, maybe it's not necessarily martingale because we have this equal cost. So, but expectation of a PNL should be zero. Uh, and as mentioned, also. Uh, over-the-counter derivatives, so if we sell an exotic derivative and we hedge it and we have this PNL average is zero, then the profit that we make is only made from the extra spread that we make by charging the client uh, initially at the inception. Uh, of course, one can ask, so you can charge as much as you want. No, because um, the spread, the no, extra charge that you would charge your client for this derivative, exotic derivative, it also has to be competitive. Because if you like to charge the spread, which is too high, um, the client could just go to a counterparty, you could go to a different bank or different institution and buy a derivative with the same features with a lower spread. So there's also competitiveness in the over-the-counter uh, market. Okay. Um, yes. So the last point here is that uh, uh, the spread is a positive. So this is our profit uh, for selling an option. Okay, um, this is an example where we have uh, uh, three periods. So um, because we have this iterative process, let's just concentrate on three periods. So we have an uh, inception where we sell an option. We have uh, one intermediate point and we have maturity of an option capital time T. Let's see based on this whether indeed the expectation of the PNL uh, at the maturity is equal to zero. Here is the filtration T0. This means that we only allow to use the knowledge that we have initially. Okay, um, initially, so time t0, we already know it. It is a value of derivative minus delta s0. At time t1, again, we take PNL from t0. It grows with a rate r t1 minus t0. And then we have a adjusted delta amount of stocks. And at maturity, so time t2, so it's a first period, second period. Uh, actually, we have three times, you can say it's two periods essentially, right? So this is be more appropriate because we start here it's the second uh, one step we do time t1 and then the second step to t2 uh, but it's called three periods it uh, doesn't really matter and finally once we are at the maturity at time t2 we have a, a, a pnl from the previous point so it's from here we have to pay depending on the payoff because at the maturity we are obliged to uh, exercise an option or a, a client can exercise an option so this is amount we have to pay and we have a, a delta t1 from the previous iteration of stocks so this is this this element would offset potential losses from the obligations that we have so if we have a uh, what we can do here we can substitute so this pnl from t1 we can just put in this term and after the substitution this is an expression that we have we have a vc0 so this is just uh, uh, so we do this expression we substitute here, and then everything we substitute to this term, we collect other terms. As you can see, the last terms are the same as here. So 
delta payoff and those intermediate terms, so the first two terms, we can, let, let's say, those are related to the hedging procedure. Uh, next step, what we want to do is to take an expectation. So we want to see whether the expectation given filtration T0, whether it is equal to zero or not. Okay, uh, by definition, so we have to use some properties because you can see that if we take an expectation here, we take expectation of a maximum, right? We take expectation, so this is constant here, but we have uh, T1, right? So this is stochastic. So initially, this is constant at T0. However, this is not constant at time uh, from perspective of time T0. This is stochastic. Also, this is stochastic, and this is stochastic too. So once we take expectation, we would have a number of uh, expressions. So let's take a look here. We have an expectation of this maximum, and this is equal to the value of derivative. Uh, how to think about it? Just take divide both sides by this term, and you, so this will be here, and then you, we will see that we have a discount. This term, the left hand side, will be discounted uh, payoff. So it's minus R T two minus T zero, right? Discounting part, and we have expectation for payoff is equal to V C T zero. So this is exactly here. So this is what from our definition. Uh, future, this is expected future payoff discounted to today is equal to the value of a derivative. So this is this expression. Now, we also know that uh, expectation of st given s is given of this form. So we know that uh, this is also a q measure, right? So remember, this is everywhere is q here. This is uh, everywhere where you see an expectation, we take it under the q measure because we did the proper uh, hedging exercise here, and also we assume that we uh, perform risk-neutral pricing. So we know that the same here, that if you put take this expectation, this exponent, under this expectation sign, because this constant doesn't change, so we know, as mentioned, I said already many times, expectation of a discounted stock to today, so this is T, is always equal to initial stock, and this money savings account, money savings account is equal to one. So this is exactly what it represents. Of course, here we have filtration FS. So here we will have uh, FS, so this is S, and then we also S here. So this is, uh, and this is that term. And after substitution, we will get an expectation here of maximum, uh, and then uh, delta ST0, ST2. So all those terms we can just, uh, uh, those expectations, we can just substitute this term, we can substitute this term, and then we have one more relation which is missing, this is this term here. For that we have a, a expectation ST1, and then exactly the same how we did for this case, it will be just, uh, so if we have a stock this ST2, we put divided by expect, uh, exponent of R T2 T1, it's equivalent as we were just discounting it, and that will be expectation uh, of uh, S T1. So you just have to be careful because now we have an uh, R T2 and R T1. So this you have to separate. So we will have an E R T2, and then we have a times E minus R T1. And then if you divide by R, R T2, that will be here. And then we end up with a, essentially with a two discounted stocks. So it's exactly what we have here. So expected stock values discounted to today, it will be equal to stock value of today, grow, which grows with a rate T2 minus uh, T0. So this is uh, just according to the Martingale properties. And if you play with this expectation a bit, with a proper T1 and T2, so this is the difference here, then you end up with this expression. After some simplification, if you put all these terms together, then you end up with indeed an expression which is equal to zero. So in this case, we have shown that once you have a, 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 a if you calculate PNL accounts and you really take care of all those uh, payments, so you have the hedging, initial hedging, you have a recursive procedure, and also finally you evaluate your you pay back uh, the, the not the premium but the value of a derivative. So it's like a, a, a payoff then the overall PNL is equal to zero. But keep in mind that this is an expectation. And that's very important because this means that yeah. it can happen that this PNL is not zero. 
it will, uh, for example, could be negative, could be positive. However, on average, it will be zero. Uh, and the distribution of this PNL will strongly depend on this delta. And this is what I will show you in a, a next block when we talk about experiment and the frequency of hedging. And you will see that once you increase the hedging frequency, then this uh, distribution, the variance of the PNL, so the, uh, the variance of the PNL, which is a random bound, will become smaller and smaller. And once you uh, do the frequency not, fre no, not too frequent hedging, then the variance will increase. This means that in a Black Scholes model, we assume that hedging takes place continuously. It's always every single infin infinitesimal moment we do the hedging. And that's something which is also an assumption of the, uh, the replicating portfolio. In practice, the hedging will not take place uh, on a, let's say, hourly or even minute basis. It will take, depending on the derivative, if the derivative has 30 years, let's say, of maturity, you will do it maybe on a weekly basis, daily basis, maybe monthly basis, but you will not do it according to the Black Scholes assumption when you have to do it in every single moment. In this experiment, we will investigate the impact of the hedging frequency on the PNL distribution. I already mentioned if we would expect that if we increase the frequency of hedges, then it will have a better impact on the PNL. This means that there will be less uncertainty in the PNL distribution. Once we perform the hedging less frequently, then it will the, the uncertainty of PNL distribution will be bigger. And this is what we would like to uh, perform confirm in this experiment right now. Uh, for that reason, we choose an option. So we have a call option with a strike 0 0.95. We have a stock uh, equal to 1, so it's an in-demand option because X is bigger than K. We have an interest rate of 10%, which doesn't really matter for the experiment. We could also choose a 0. Uh, volatility is 20% and maturity is uh, 1 year. So we perform the experiment as we described in the, um, in the slides. So we perform this iterative process of building up our PNL, and we will see the distribution of the, of the stock, the distribution of PNL. Uh, this is uh, uh, the results that we obtain. So before we look into Python code, let's take a look at what, uh, what, how to interpret the results. So this is a results that we see is for one single path. So a blue line here, it is a, a stock which starts at uh, one and goes to, you see it's uh, around 1.4. The second scenario, we have a stock which also starts at one, so it's a different path, starts at one and then ends up lower than the strike. So this case is option which is uh, out of the money, and of course here is in the money because strike was zero point, so K was uh, zero point nine five, and our stock end up with around one point four, so it's a dip in the money option. This is also what you can see, so it's a, a green line, it's a delta. Uh, delta, it started around 0 0.8, 0 0.9, and converged to 1. So it basically says, uh, if you really want to hedge your position, so once you have sold a call option and you like to hedge it with a delta hedge, you need to have almost, you have to have one stock to hedge that. And this is obvious because once we have a reach, exceed this, uh, uh, we are higher than a strike, we are higher than 0 0.95, this means more and more stocks we need to have. Actually, it's a one option on one stock, so it's a bigger portion of that stock we need to have. And at some point, because of the uncertainty, because of the volatility, we need to have 100% to be properly hedged. So here, if we have a stock going to 50, for example, then we have one stock. Because delta is one, we have one stock. So then at the maturity, we will just pay that out to our client. Um, here we have a value of a call option, so you see it is also uh, growing it. As you can see, it actually resembles very much shape of a, uh, of a stock, uh, because stock and option, those are just a, it's a one uh, risk factor inside is the stock itself. So a call option is obviously will resemble the same the same shape. Uh, then we have also PNL. You see our PNL goes very much down, and at the end we have a jump. And this is related to the fact that we have uh, sold our stock with the Delta stocks. We sold it, so we gained that. And at the end, we have a value of a zero. Uh, in here, in this case, out of the money option, uh, stock first uh, from one is, went up and then went down. Delta first went because our stock increased, so we need to pay more. Uh, we need to, um, the value of our, 
obligations will increase. But once stock at the end especially start going down, then Delta immediately jump uh, towards zero. So you see, because actually this is kind of interesting also figure here, because if you have, a, you see stock didn't end up so much far away from uh, strike. It is just lower below the strike. However, Delta immediately went to zero. And this has to do with uh, uncertainty. Uh, so you remember square root of delta time. So here at this point, once we are here and this point, if you are here, so we here we have a one year to go. Here we have only 0 0.2 of a year to go. So obviously this impact of volatility, it is smaller and smaller. So if your stock went out of the money, it's a lower than a strike, then uh, according to Black Scholes assumption, there is a smaller chance that you end up in the money. So this effect of time, it is very important. And once it goes down and stock further goes down, this delta goes really fast to zero. And once you are actually close to uh, maturity, delta says you should not have this stock in your hedging at all, because very likely your function, your uh, value will end up uh, worthless. So if you are, let's say, a few days, uh, few days away from the maturity and your stock is lower than 0.95, uh, and you have low volatility, according to Black Scholes model, it would be just, it is not worth to have the underlying, not worth to hedge it. It will very likely, the option value will be just worthless. This option will be worthless, so you should not be hedged. Uh, of course, if something would happen in the market, then it's a different story, because then it would mean you are exposed. But here we assume that this ideal, idealized world where we have Black Scholes stock, and we also have a Black Scholes hedging strategy. Uh, in the next book, I will discuss jumps. So what would happen if you perform delta hedging according to Black Scholes model? However, your stock it's not uh, doesn't follow Black Scholes, but has a jump. And this is something which uh, uh, which could be is much more realistic, right? Because if we assume that reality behaves like Black Scholes, and, and our modeling behaves like is the same as Black Scholes. So we would say it's a closed environment. Once we consider jumps, it is uh, much more difficult, and you will see there will be some additional problems. And this is uh, also from the PL perspective. You see that it actually went down, and of course, at the end, it converged to zero because we have an option which is worthless and value, uh, and we had delta stocks at the end. So it's nicely smoothly moves to towards zero. It's also, you see, it's a kind of mirrored shape of our PL to the, to the green line. Uh, here it's more jumpy, and this is related to the the uh, fact that we have to sell our delta stocks. Uh, of course, in this PL experiment, the definition of PL you could redefine it, right? So this is uh, a choice that we have made that you pay it your delta stocks at the end, and there is a jump. You could uh, this expression for PL could be handled slightly different, so it would be smoother transition because essentially your PL should also show you the current value of all the stock you have, right? So uh, this is to keep in mind. But at the end, this is just uh, a representation of the portfolio. At the end, PL should show you what is the current value of the asset that you have in your portfolio. Okay, let's take a look now at the uh, Python code. Uh, so here is uh, an experiment. So uh, I'm not going through all the details. So as before, we had uh, path generations for uh, geometric body motion. We have a Black Scholes formula. This is important because Black Scholes formula is used. Uh, not only for pricing, but also for delta. So delta is based on the Black Scholes formula. Then we have a Black Scholes delta. So this is sensitivity of the Black Scholes formula uh, to uh, uh, to S zero. Right. So current value of the stock. Of course, once we talk about uh, uh, edging on a growth level, then this delta it's not anymore a zero here. Right. It is a stock current value of the stock. So imagine you travel in time every time on a path. Whenever value of a stock changes, then you have to use this uh, different realization of a zero uh, in uh, in a delta hedge. So this is something to keep in mind. It's not as zero only once. You all kind of you go in time and then you always use different value of a zero. So you go along the path. So it's also good to make sure that your implementation handles vectors because if you have multiple uh, many paths, then you would like to you, know, you don't want to redo it for every path. You just like to do it for all of them at the same time. Okay, um, configuration for our payoff. We have uh, 10 re hedgings. So we assume that we have 10 steps and we have uh, 5,000 paths. Uh, let me maybe hide this graph here so that it's not tempting to conclude anything yet from here. Uh, we have a C, so it's a call option price. 
So we defined CP is a call, and the black holes control would come with call. Uh, and then we have a lambda expression, but now we have for three arguments. We have a T, K, and S0. Uh, so T, it's our running time. So you see that's uh, two arguments value today in maturity come capital time T. So this will be obviously changing because once we go in time, the distance between maturity becomes shorter and shorter. Then we have a K, which is, uh, in this experiment, K doesn't matter so much because K is fixed. And we have a S0 because that's uh, uh, our uh, initial value. However, also keep in mind this S0 is only a zero today. So it's a nickel value today. But once we go in time, we would like to calculate the value of black holes for S0, which is actually value of a path. So this is very important. So this S0 is actually stochastic as we, we go along the path because today is S0 we know, but we don't know the S0 which will be tomorrow, right? So once we are tomorrow, that's a different value of S0, but we don't know it today. But this will be also clear in this code here. Uh, then we have some uh, storage uh, elements. So we have uh, call options that we store and, uh, and uh, PNL, which is, uh, so P for PNL, again, we do uh, value of a call option. So you see, we call it at, uh, this is three arguments we have called. So it's a time T0, we have a strike K and we have S0. So this is just a value of a call option seen today in the market. We have an initial delta, which is defined here. So we have a delta, it is, uh, t0, so it's a 0, 0. We have a strike k and s0, and we multiply when you show stock, stock value. So this is just the initial PNL construction. And then we iterate over all the time steps. So uh, we calculate delta all. So you see, we, we put a, a time t and previous time step. We have a previous whole vector of stocks. So it's a previous uh, si minus 1, ti minus 1 vector of stocks and we calculate current delta. And this is related, maybe you remember, we were looking at the difference between deltas, different time steps, right? So initially we hedge with a full delta, delta T0, but at the next time step, we only look at the difference between delta T1 minus delta T0. And this is how we, we also have to do it here. But you see now, this that we always have to uh, keep in mind that we it, the stock value is stochastic, it's not constant value, right? So we have to, uh, incorporate vectors in there. So we have old vector, uh, de delta old, delta current. Those are two vectors because it's calculated for all the paths. And then we have a PNL, which is again previous PNL, which grows with the rate R dt. dt is a, uh, a delta. So you see it's here is a distance. It's it's an whole interval between times t a minus one and t i, and we have a minus. And then we have a delta current minus delta alt, and then we have a S time T. So this is as we had in the formula. And then uh, we also store the call values. So it's a call matrix. So this is just in this uh, graph. Maybe remember we had green uh, line, and this is this uh, element. So we have a time, and then we have a, a stock vector. Uh, you can also hear in this lambda expression. We, uh, you see that capital T is not an argument. Capital T is essentially taken from here, from the arguments, because we didn't use it as the uh, argument for lambda expression. And as long as we, actually in this case, we don't need it, so this is irrelevant. And the same for delta here, we just kept T is given to one. We never change it, so no point of defining it as the parameter. Okay, and uh, next, what we do, the final step, so once we iterate, so it's a for loop over all these time steps, and if you have one more time step where we say final PNL, we have to subtract our uh, payoff, depending whether it's uh, in the money or out of the money, and we have to sell our delta M uh, stocks. It's the last value that we see in the market. This is kind of, uh, we had a contract over the lifetime of the derivative, and now we have to pay back the obligations. So if, the, if this option ends up in the money, we have to pay to clients, and we have to sell our hedge because we don't need this hedge anymore. So we pay obligations and we gain from the hedge because we have to sell the hedge. So let's uh, let's see how it looks like. So this is the this, so here we had this uh, uh, what we have seen already in the in the slide. So this is uh, delta PNL and the stocks, and here is the histogram of PNL. So depending on uh, uh, stocks, 
um, depending on the frequency of the hedges, we will see different distribution. It does, it's not normal, right? It's a, it looks like it's a bit flatter tail. It's a peak around zero. And we have to, here the, the lowest value is minus 0 0.1, and the highest is 0 0.05. You see, it's always a downside that you can you may lose more than you can actually gain. Uh, now let's increase the frequency. So we have fifth, we have 10 time steps. Let's make it uh, 25. So remember, oh, sorry, it's 25. So we have the minus 0 0.1, 0 0.05. Let's repeat the experiment. Oh, indeed, we see the distribution is much, uh, especially on this side, the losses are much smaller than before. Let me make it 100 steps. You see now it is uh, very clear that by increasing the frequency, we actually really help distribution for PNL. It's much more narrower, uh, concentrate around zero. And let me see if we can do 50 maybe. Final experiment, 250, you see it just increases, increases further. And maybe 1,000, you see how this will look like. You see, so once we increase number, the, the frequency of the hedges, and that significantly improves the distribution for PNL. It's something what we expected to see. Of course, you also see some action here happening. Uh, you see delta changes a lot here. The, the delta is the green line. Uh, if your option, like you see this blue line here, is around the money level, not the maturity, this means delta change is really significantly because it could be that you have to pay a lot or you basically around zero. So the, del the delta is uh, is moving a lot. You could improve that by looking also at gamma. So depending on the sensitivity of delta to the stock, that could also help in hedging. Uh, but this is the, the experiment here was mostly concentrated on a, a histogram for the PN. As an extension, what we can also do is to perform the hedging experiment while we are changing the dynamics of the uh, model. So previously we had a Black-Scholes model and we performed hedging or delta hedging uh, based on a Black-Scholes model. And now let's see what will happen once we change the dynamics of the model um, as given in the slides with a jump diffusion. So we add extra jump component and we try to perform hedging uh, based on Black-Scholes. So in this experiment, we will compute delta as the effect of jump. So as this effect of the drift, and also this part will be gone. So we pretend that we have a Black-Scholes model. However, we simulate the process as given with uh, the dynamics here. So this is the uh, jump diffusion process we have already discussed earlier in this course, where we have a jump component, we have a Poisson distribution, a Poisson process, and also we have a jump component for the uh, jump magnitude. And we have additionally uh, a drift correction that would correspond to the uh, to the risk neutrality, right? So we have a Brownian motion under the Q measure. So this is a, this additional uh, uh, compensated Poisson process effect, which has to be in a drift. Okay, um, so this is the results that we see. So you see already here, uh, we can see that there is a stock which has a, a jump in this moment. And uh, of course, once we have a jump in a stock, the, this will have directly effect on a delta and also on a call option price and PL. So you see there is a, a the jump is basically propagating through the all the elements that we uh, we defined. PL calculation, delta, everything is based as we have discussed, is based on the Black Scholes model. Uh, in general, PL that we have um, defined earlier does not really depend on the model. It depends on only on a delta hedge. Uh, but in the experiment, we only considered that uh, uh, the jumps will be also, uh, the delta will be calculated based on the Black-Scholes model. Uh, another run, so this is path number one, this is path number two, where we see there is a jump upwards and there is a jump downwards. So this is also something that is uh, 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 frequently seen in a market also. So if we think of a jump, don't only think of a jump which can happen only upwards or only downwards. Uh, given this model, we can have a jumps in a different directions. You can see that there is a, this quantity can be either positive or negative, and then we have a jump going upward or downward. So depending on uh, uh, on those uh, coefficients. Um, okay, so let's let's take a look at the code. Uh, in this case, let me see. 
so um, we essentially uh, leave everything as we had before. So all these elements of generating, maybe except for generating paths. So as you can see, we have only one change in this code is that uh, now we consider uh, um, the, the Poisson uh, jump process, which is included in a, uh, in a, in a diffusion model, right? So we had a black Scholes model essentially, and we have a jump effect, which we also uh, also need to correct for the drift. Uh, note that in the slides we have seen S, here in the simulation we have X, X. And you see there's a slight difference between the, um, the jump component. Uh, but I think if you go back to uh, our lecture where we discussed jumps, then you will see the relation between X and S, so X, is a logarithm of our stock, and, and the stock is driven by a Poisson diffusion Poisson process. So we in the slides I gave you uh, directly the connection connection uh, between X and S. So please take uh, revisit that part. Uh, so uh, for simulation purposes, it is always easier, and it helps in the convergence once we talk about uh, uh, logarithmic transformation. So this is why also, also the logarithmic transformation is considered this, in this experiment. Um, only so what, what is here, uh, we have this expectation of uh, exponent to power j, which is given in a closed form. So we have a j, uh, we assume it's a uh, j is normally distributed with mu and sigma squared, and those parameters will be configured later on. So we only change in this experiment the dynamics for the stock. However, uh, uh, the, the, the sensitivity, the delta, is con considered to be just based on the Black-Scholes model. In practice, what you would do, it is that your delta that you are using for hedging should also correspond to the model that you are uh, simulating, right? So you basically, if you have a derivative that you use, let's say, a complicated model, uh, delta should correspond to the model. So this is very important, that sensitivity of your model price given the change if underlying asset. And that's quite important because otherwise you will, otherwise you will have inconsistency between uh, model which generates the prices, the values, and your hedging parameters. So this has to be very uh, very much consistent. But here it is much more for the illustrative uh, purposes. And uh, if we go back here, we see a PL calculation exactly the same as we had before. Uh, and then the final transaction for PL, where we have a maximum, uh, where we pay back uh, the, the premium, the, 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 the payoff, and we sell our stock. So this is with a plus. And what we can do, we can just simulate our path. So again, we see a jump, so this is good. We see the first part is diffusive, then we have a jump. And uh, this part here, this histogram, shows us the distribution of PNL. And you see it is not really uh, symmetric as we have seen for the, uh, for the previous case when, where we had a, a Black-Scholes model with um, delta which corresponded to the, to the model. Uh, there we could see that there was a symmetric and once we increase the frequency, of delta hedging, then the distribution was becoming narrower and narrower. We could really, uh, that was clearly seen. But here you can see that it's actually not the case. So we see that our PNL is much more on the negative side. So we can have much more losing uh, paths than winning paths. Uh, this can also have to do maybe with uh, uh, the jump distribu distribution, whether it's a mu is positive, let's see here. So whether we have uh, more positive jumps or negative, but mu here is chosen to be a zero. So it means we are more in a symmetric uh, side. However, we have this exponent of J, think of that. So we have logarithmic uh, jumps. So uh, that would also have impact on, on the PNL distribution. Let's try now to increase number of uh, uh, steps. So we have 200 steps. Let's try it with uh, 500 steps and see whether this would have impact on our uh, on a distribution of PNL. So the lowest was minus 0 0.1. You see, actually nothing has changed. Distribution uh, stays the, very much the same. Yes, the lowest value is still around minus 0 0.1. Let's do here a thousand. So thousand uh, thousand rehedging uh, rehedges in a lifetime of a contract. You see, maybe there is a little bit less observations here compared to here, because here is 100, so this is around maybe 20. 
here we see okay it is indeed lower however there is much more concentration around zero however we cannot really remove the effect of uh, losing trades so the distribution doesn't really it becomes maybe a little bit uh, narrower but you cannot really uh, reduce the effect of losing and that's the problematic part here let's make it now 5000 uh, time steps so we have at 5000 times we will rehedge our position Of course, it will take much longer than before. Yes, so again, uh, we see that there is the same pattern. So we can reduce slightly uh, negative PL. However, overall, we cannot really change the, the area, the, the axis. You see that there is, the range is still from minus uh, 0 0.1 to 0. And for every case we considered, what was always the same case. So that's really not uh, helping. And this is one of this, uh, also disadvantages of using jumps. Typically, it is much more complicated to have a, a nice hedge once you consider jumps in your in your dynamics of the model. So that's a, a commonly it's known uh, uh, feature of a jump diffusion processes. For that reason, models like Heston are more commonly used. Another problem is that if you have a jump, then your uh, strategy would need to maybe sometimes change dramatically. So, for example, from being extremely long, you would need to be extremely short. And that's something that traders don't really like because if you you can imagine that once you need to sell or buy and you have to change your position dramatically, that would be very expensive in terms of transaction costs, for example. So that, that's not very beneficial. So jump diffusion jump models are not so much uh, frequently used in practice. Uh, I see that there is much more uh, attention to diffusive models because they're easier to understand, easier to often simulate. And the, the transition in Greeks is much more smoother than if you would have a, a model with, uh, with jumps. How we could fix this? So um, the question would be, OK, once we have a jump, how we can reduce this effect? And the simplest way to reduce the jump effect uh, or in a PNL, once we have a volatility, uh, so then we talk about also about Vega hedges. Once we have a jump in our option, so if you have a stock with a jump and we would like to hedge our option, uh, the natural way would be to hedge it with another option. So this means option with, for example, different strike. So we will need to have this jump effect also included in a hedge. Then, uh, then the, the hedging would be much better and then we could actually reduce this PL distribution. So if you, have a, if you like to hedge a volatility, you like to hedge a jump, always think of hedging it with an option. So not only delta hedged when we just hedge with underlying, think of hedging uh, uh, with an option. Uh, there was also in literature, there was a lot of studies done. How many options would you need to have once you have actually jump diffusion uh, process? And I think magic number, it is seven. <laughs> so if you have uh, around five to seven, I think, options, then you can uh, reduce the effect of jumps once you perform hedging of an option. So imagine that this is quite an expensive procedure. You have a derivative that you like to hedge and you need to buy seven different derivatives of different composition of those derivatives to hedge the contract that you have sold. So this is also one of the reasons why jumps are not so popular. Uh, however, they are very realistic, but they are also um, expensive in terms of uh, hedging and pricing. Our numerical experiments have shown that delta hedge in the context of Black-Scholes model performs very well. By increasing the frequency of hedging, we can actually reduce the, the standard deviation, the volatility of the PNL. And this is something that we expected to see. However, however, once we talk about pricing and we talk about different models, there are many more Greeks, also in the context of Black Scholes. The question here would be how to use different sensitivities, different Greeks for hedging. One of the most important Greek that I would like to discuss um, is Viga. Viga, it is a sensitivity of the value of derivative to volatility. Uh, Viga for call and put option under the Black Scholes model, it is the same quantity. So once we have a Black Scholes formula, we can just calculate the sensitivity, and this is the equation we have. Uh, in this case, the D2, it is a, a, a function of all the model parameters. It was defined in the slides in the lecture where we discussed the Black Scholes model. So please take a look here. There, uh, of course, the rest of the parameters is just uh, model parameters. So this is the same as we had for delta. For delta, we have a sensitivity of uh, a value of a call or put option with respect to S0, the initial, uh, the stock value. And here we have a sensitivity to respect to uh, volatility. Uh, 
Uh, Vega for call and put options is the same. It is not the case for Delta. So for Delta, depending on uh, uh, either it's a call or put, um, the, the Delta is diff slightly different. Um, another important point is that uh, why we actually have seen the, um, such a great results once we talked about the Black-Scholes model. Why the Delta hedge was just doing very well. Why we didn't see any problems and any need to incorporate different uh, Greeks in our hedging strategy. And the problem was that in our model that we have simulated, so we assumed that the market is driven by Black-Scholes model. And so we simulated a stock process with given, given model parameters. And our hedging strategy was corresponding to that dynamics of the model. Uh, so we a little bit cheated there because we assumed that the reality follows also Black-Scholes model with sigma parameter, which was constant. So there was no uncertainty, there was no changing of the volatility in time. However, in practice, once we would just go to the every day, we will calibrate our model and we simulate paths, then of course our volatility coefficient would be different. Uh, for that reason, we would also need to perform delta hedging. But because we assume that the Black-Scholes model, under the assumptions of Black-Scholes model, that sigma is constant, the, the, there is no need to perform any uh, Vega hedging. However, in practice, it would be the case because we always, the volatility coefficient would change or it's time dependent or even stochastic. This would mean that we need to perform uh, also hedging of the uncertainty related to volatility changes. So it's not only that stock changes, but also volatility. And that can be seen in uh, uh, the market prices for options. So even if, for example, the stock uh, is behaving exactly the same as yesterday, the implied volatility could be much larger. And that can be seen in a smile shape and the implied volatility, uh, of course, if we have an option market. Um, so in, in practice, um, um, to, to hedge Viga, so once we talk about uh, practice and we will have a portfolio of derivatives contracts that would have a vegan. So if we uh, we don't consider constant volatility, but we would uh, recalibrate our model, we will have a different v uh, sigma parameter every day. That would mean that we will need to also hedge our Viga. The best way to hedge our Viga would be with uh, buying or selling options that would also correspond. So if you have a, a payoff which is sensitive to volatility, in order to hedge, in order to offset that effect, you would also need to buy or sell a product which also is sensitive to volatility, which is uh, kind of natural. Um, yes, so you have to buy or sell options. Typically, uh, once we talk about hedging, we always go for a product which is the cheapest. So if you have an exotic derivative, let's say some callable product, which depends on volatility, you'll be always targeting hedging uh, with options of similar features as your exotic derivative. So for example, if you have a Bermudan uh, option, you would try to hedge it maybe with European option and making sure that the dates when the Bermudan option could be called would correspond to option, the European style option. That would be, the hedge would be rather cheap. If you'd buy, uh, if you like to buy exotic derivative to hedge another exotic derivative, that could be considered uh, expensive, especially in the over the counter market where you cannot just buy like in a supermarket on the screen from the exchange, but you need to call a counterparty and you need to ask for a particular trade that's typically more expensive. Um, hedging of a Delta and Viga, uh, there also the frequency is uh, slightly different. So Delta is typically something that you continuously monitor and you perform hedging, uh, let's say on a daily base basis uh, for Viga hedging it's considered to be more expensive because you need to buy options, options that have additional premium. So that frequency uh, of hedging for volatility could be much less than if you talk about uh, hedging of Delta. In practice, traders would have uh, um, why they basically why the hedging would be important because every day after the trading day is finished, traders, they have to make sure that they, the in over portfolio that they have. So if they traded over whole day, they have a portfolio of trades that there is a limit of a Delta and Viga, and that limit is not exceeded. So this means traders, they cannot take too much risk. There is a limitation on the positions that they may have. Uh, also additional point is that uh, um, once you have an option and you like to hedge it, um, then what we already have seen, you would construct some hedging portfolio, you have hedging strategy. 
Uh, however, if you uh, aggregate different traits, so if you have one option with one counterparty, you have another option with other counterparty, what you can do, you can aggregate all those options together and then build up a portfolio of traits. Then you would look at Delta, uh, Delta, Viga, and for example, different Greeks like Gamma, and then you would do hedging at the portfolio level. And that would be beneficial because imagine situation, you bought one contract, one option from one counterparty, and you have sold a similar contract or something slightly different to other counterparty. Those two contracts would have Viga, for example, but they will have a Viga in different direction or Delta in different direction. This means that there will be netting effect. So you would overall reduce your risk because one side you'll be long and one side you'll be short. So there could be a netting effect when uh, values will offset each other. Uh, let's take a look at the example when we, when, once we talk about the Delta and the, uh, Viga hedging. So in this experiment or this, uh, let's say, ex exercise, we consider a portfolio and in this portfolio we will have uh, stocks and derivatives so we have uh, um, imagine just standard we will have some some derivatives with uh, calls and puts whatever and we would also have a stock uh, delta is 50 and v guys 200 this means that we calculated this portfolio and we computed sensitivity of a not of v but to be let's say of summation of all the v's so we would have a derivative of of a v's with respect to sigma, this will be our portfolio Viga, and we would also have delta, which will be sum of all the trades over S. So that will be our overall delta. This is the uh, Viga of a portfolio. This is our delta of the portfolio. So once we calculated in this portfolio level, uh, Greeks, delta, and Viga, we, are, we see that there is a delta of 50 and Viga is 200. Our objective is to buy stock, or sell stock and also use call option in order to uh, reduce that uh, that risk. So we have a risk of delta. This means delta is 50, Viga is 200. We would like to reduce that risk. So what we do, we take an option with some strike K. We use the Black Scholes model, for example. We check, okay, delta for this option is 0 0.7 and Viga is 10. We would like to use this derivative to reduce the risk of a delta of 50 and a Viga of 200. So we have a question, how to, how many call options we have to buy in order to hedge our portfolio? And this is something which is very natural. This is how the hedging would be performed in practice, that we have a portfolio, portfolio shows some risks like deltas, Vigas, and we have uh, some market instruments and now we choose, okay, how many of those market instruments we should buy or sell in order to reduce the portfolio risk. Okay, um, first of all, the question is what we start with. Shall we start with Delta or shall we start with Viga? And uh, mm, practice is that you, you should always start with uh, uh, something more complicated. In this case, Viga. Uh, the reason is that if you hedge your Delta, so you have reduced this Delta to zero, by hedging your Viga, and buying or selling, um, so hedging your Viga would mean that you need to buy or sell some options, right? So by buying and selling options, you can reduce this uh, Viga here on the portfolio level, but that would also influence your Delta. As you can see, there is a, if you would buy or sell this option, you also influence the Delta. So typically we start with a, a Viga in this case, and then we also check what is the impact on Delta and then what is remaining, we would make sure that this will be our last hedge. So first we hedge with options, and once that is done, we recalculate over all risk, and then we look at the, what is the delta remaining, and that could be done with stock. So first we hedge with the most complicated derivative that we have, and then what is left, we calculate, we hedge with uh, uh, underlying stock. So in this case, so you, if you would like to, uh, we follow here, so we have a 200 of Viga, we have a Viga of 10 for a hedging instrument, we divide, we see, okay, we need to have a, uh, 20, so we need to sell, because we have a positive uh, Viga here, we need to sell 20 call options, right? So that means that if we had 200 here, we have a 20 of those, so it's a 200. Overall Viga uh, of the new portfolio would be zero. However, we also influence, because we, we sold those uh, deltas, this means we have a, 
and 50 from the previous portfolio value of delta, then we have minus 20 times 0 0.7 because we sold 20 options with delta 0 0.7. This means we have a delta of 36. So this is a 36 is a delta of a new portfolio. So in order now to reduce this 36, so we see actually by buying those, by selling those options, we reduced our Viga and we also slightly reduce our delta, right? So this is something that we, we see. And now what we have to do is the last point is to hedge our delta. And to hedge our delta, we hedge it with uh, selling uh, 36 stocks. And then this makes sure that uh, delta and Viga hedge will be Viga and hedge of this portfolio will be zero. Uh, why we do the stocks at the end? Because stock doesn't have a Viga. There is no sensitivity to Viga, it's just a, a stock value. So then uh, obviously by selling those stocks, we don't influence Viga of our uh, uh, portfolio. And of course, if we buy and sell options, we influence both. We influence Viga and we also influence Delta. So this is why we start with an exotic derivative and then we go from the most complicated to the simplest. Another derivative, another hedging that we can think of is so-called gamma hedging. Maybe you have heard of it. And gamma hedging, it tells us it's a, you can say it's a hedging of a Delta. So um, gamma is derivative of a Delta. So that we, this is the Delta hedging that we, we talk about. And we check the sensitivity of Delta to stock. So this is, this is the final as follows. The second order derivative of a value of a, our uh, derivative uh, and the, with respect to stock. And this is the same as for Viga. It is a closed form for Black Scholes case and for call and put option is the same. Um, high Viga, for, sorry, high Gamma corresponds to the high variation of Delta. So you know that's the kind of derivative of a Delta. If it's high, this means that the Delta will change a lot. So this means also that if it's high Delta, you need to uh, uh, rebalance your portfolio more often in order to, to maintain low delta. So this is very informative. Um, we cannot use stock to hedge gamma. So you see, if you have a stock and you do derivative of stock with respect to stock, it's just one. So delta of stock is one, but gamma of stock is zero because it's just a constant. So you cannot use gamma for any, uh, you cannot use stocks for hedging uh, uh, to hedge gamma. Uh, you have to do as you, as we just discussed for Viga, in order to hedge gamma, you also need to look at other derivatives like options or other derivatives, which will be also sensitive to the second order derivative. So for options, you can see options you can use for hedging your gamma. And this is very similar to, um, to Viga. In the case of Black Scholes model, uh, the grids, the sensitivities to either stock or sensitivities to model parameters like sigma, which was Viga, uh, they were closed form because uh, Black Scholes model is given in closed form. So those sensitivities we could simply derive. However, more important question is how we would derive uh, those sensitivities once we talk about a model for which we don't know the closed form solution and we have to simulate this, the model using Monte Carlo. So now we will be talking about uh, calculation of uh, Greeks using Monte Carlo simulation. And there are a few approaches to, to tackle this problem. One, um, the, the mo most commonly known and used is the finite difference. This means that based on a Taylor uh, expansion, we can have a two approaches. We could either shock our parameters. So if you look at the discretization, if we have a sensitivity to, uh, we would like to calculate sensitivity of a value of a derivative to some parameter theta, this can be simply approximated by finite difference when we have a forward difference. So we calculate, we need to calculate our derivative twice because we will first, we will calculate the expected value of discounted payoff with parameter theta which is uh, shocked or call it, people call it shocked or bumped or adjusted with delta t. Then we also we need to have one run for our value of derivative. And then we need to divide it by delta t. And that will be an approximation of uh, uh, sensitivity of the value of a derivative to theta. Uh, this first uh, or first approximation, it has an order of uh, O delta uh, delta theta. So this is the order of this approximation. Uh, an alternative, it is uh, uh, based on a central difference when we talk about uh, first order derivative, so first order sensitivity to parameter where we do shocking twice. 
So if you you can imagine that if you like to if you perform pricing with uh, some parameter theta, you will need to perform two additional runs. So once with a parameter which is shocked upwards. So if you have a Black Scholes model, for example, with sigma, you will need to change that parameter upward, rerun the simulation. We will also need to perform additional run with a downward movement, so minus delta theta and divided by the uh, delta, uh, two times delta t. So and this order of approximation is uh, delta uh, theta squared. So you can see that actually, uh, uh, numerically, you could, would, so you would consider that this approach is uh, cheaper because this is the value of derivative. So this is something that you would pre-calculate anyway. So you need to have one additional run of your Monte Carlo simulation in order to obtain the approximation for your finite difference. However, in this case, you say, okay, actually, this is more expensive because I need to perform first the pricing. So you need to perform this kind of estimation. However, you still will need to perform twice more. Uh, you have to perform two more runs. So for first pricing would be with a parameter adjusted upward. And then you would have also to perform pricing with parameter performed downward. And then once you collect them, you have sensitivity of uh, value to theta. So often I see that people, depending on the, whether the, how complex is their model, and they don't know analytically the, the sensitivities, then they, they, they typically tend to choose depending on of course how complex is the simulation they either choose something which is cheaper which is this one or something more expensive of course we cannot forget about order of error so this is order of a delta theta this is order of delta theta squared so this is definitely of a higher order so this is more accurate uh, let's take a look at the experiments so in this experiment here we have a, we have a delta s0 here we have a central difference which is the red line and we have a forward difference, which is a blue line. So you see clearly the error is much smaller, especially if we talk about uh, small shocks. So we look at the delta S0, which is small, so delta, essentially delta H. Uh, for small shocks, uh, you see that there's a significant difference between uh, two approaches. Uh, here it was delta, here we talk about Viga. Uh, this is something interesting. So if you have uh, shock sizes, which are big, you can see that central difference actually is worse at some point than a forward difference. However, note that this is 10 to minus 3. So this is much smaller than here. We had here 10 to minus 1, right? So 10 to minus 1. Here we have 10 to minus 3. So still the effect, the impact is much smaller. And obviously you would not in practice choose this kind of large shock size. You would go typically for something maybe 10 to minus 3, 10 to minus 4. So still would be on that lower end. And then you see there is a benefit of using central difference compared to uh, forward, because then you can see it's a multiple times uh, your results will be more accurate. And the same is here. So you typically, uh, if you talk about the delta H, you'll be looking at the small uh, shock sizes uh, in the computation of sensitivities. So all the computation of Greeks using finite difference seems to be the most natural way to compute those. There are alternatives, and those alternatives uh, may improve the convergence and actually facilitate much better results compared to the uh, finite difference. As we already discussed before, once you know some extra information about the payoff, maybe about the dynamics of a process, and then always search whether you are able to use that information in somehow in the computations. Another one of the possibilities is actually uh, the sensitivity, the Monte Carlo grids using the pathwise sensitivities. It's a very nice way uh, of computing the grids, especially once we know something about the payoff. Uh, in this, this is in particularly uh, accurate and nice once we have European types of payoffs. Uh, and if we know the something about the stochastic process that is used for pricing. So let us take a look. So sensitivity of a value of a derivative to some parameter theta, uh, it is essentially derivative of theta. And then we have, a, as we always have, a expectation under risk neutral measure. We have some payoff, and this is European style payoff, discounted to today. So this is a payoff value discounted to today. Uh, the trick in this approach, or the main, the, the, the core element of this approach, 
is the interchange of differentiation and expectation operator. So as we can see here, with a partial derivative with respect to theta, we have expectation, which is essentially an integral. Then we uh, interchange the integration with the differentiation, and then we end up with an expectation under risk neutral measure uh, of the derivative of the value uh, of, of our contract uh, discounted with the um, money savings account. So of course, if we uh, consider constant interest rates, this is parameter would be this uh, mt would be independent of theta this can go outside so end up we end up with uh, uh, the following expression we have a discounting which comes from this mt and we have an expectation under risk neutral measure and then we have uh, just a chain rule so derivative of v with respect to s times s de derivative with respect to s of respect to theta so this is the relation that we have now the, there is a key element, the key question we have, uh, if we know our payoff, how this payoff depends on S. If this derivative is known, that's obvious, obviously that would improve uh, in our results because once we can incorporate knowledge that we know about the payoff or the dynamics and we incorporate in uh, uh, expectation as such, that definitely would help in achieving better convergence. And then the second part here, if we know the, the dynamics, the solution for stock, and we are able to calculate this derivative with respect to parameter that would obviously help in a, uh, getting better convergence. So let us take a look. So in a case of, uh, uh, this is an example, we have a um, payoff, which is European call option, and the stock is driven by the Black-Scholes model. So you see Black-Scholes model, we have uh, uh, just a solution where we have uh, two parameters. We can say S0, which is our for delta purposes, and we have a sigma for Viga. If we have a, this uh, payoff, so we have a maximum of st minus k, we can also calculate derivative with respect to st. So you see the st is just here, right? So we know that it will be just because our payoff. Uh, so if we have a, here the graph, we know that this is a, a k. We have a zero before and then everything grows like this. So we know that we will have a, a derivative of, of course, this is the uh, line, so this is our payoff. If we calculate this derivative to be, of course, zero uh, before S um, is uh, reaching level K, and then it will be just a constant number. So if we talk about the sensitivity, sensitivity, we, of course, we have, sorry, it should be just, uh, uh, let me see, it will be this part, and then we have uh, this part. So this is zero part, and then we have a value one. And this is what is given here. So derivative of the payoff with respect to stock it is given by, in, by indicator function st is bigger than strike. And this is what, uh, what we have calculated. So this is obviously, this is knowledge that we can incorporate in uh, computation of the sensitivity. We don't need to do a finite difference. We can just incorporate this in the expectation. Uh, on, the second, on the other hand, so what we can also do, we, we also know something about sensitivities to particular parameters. So for delta h, so delta is given here. So it's a sensitivity uh, to the S parameter. Maybe I should not write delta here. It is basically for delta purposes. And then we have here viga. So uh, since we know the derivative respect to payoff, we still need to have a derivative of a stock with respect to these two parameters. So initial stock, that's simple because S0 is only present uh, before the exponent. So it is just an exponent. And sensitivity of S with respect to sigma, it will be ST, because obviously we have a, uh, this is exponential form. So this is ST, and then we have a derivative under the expectation, under, under the exponent, of course. And then we have a minus sigma T minus T0, and then we have Brownian motion. So this is the two ingredients that are necessary to calculate sensitivity. So, sensitivity. so now if we go back, uh, we know this, pay, this uh, derivative from the payoff. And we also depend on the theta, whether theta is equal to uh, S0 or sigma, we can just calculate uh, these derivatives and substitute in this expectation. So let us do uh, this now. So um, sensitivity to uh, S0, so this is now our delta H. It is simply an indicator function here under the expectation. And here we have uh, an exponent and all those elements that we have calculated from the uh, from the previous slide. So obviously this will be just, we can just, uh, this part is equal to st minus st0 times the indicator function st at the maturity bigger than k. So once we calculated this expectation, 
uh, we know the sensitivity to delta. So as you, you see, this is much simpler than calculating with a finite difference. Because once we have a paths for stock, we can simply calculate this expectation. So we don't need to do any finite difference. We just evaluate expectation on paths that we have computed. Because we need to compute those paths anyway, once we talk about evaluation of a payoff. So obviously, this is not does not really require additional uh, re-simulations. It just requires computation on a, on given the simulation that we have performed. And for the variance, for sorry, for the variance for the Viga is very similar. So we have again uh, indicator function. So this is the same as here for uh, uh, for delta, uh, and then we have uh, this coefficient. If there's some simplification, we can express this as the expectation, and then we have a ST, so value of a stock at the maturity. Then we have a logarithm of ST over ST0. So this is the same stock logarithm of it. And then we have some drift uh, correction term. Uh, and then indicator function, as we had for uh, here and also here for delta case. So that's also, again, once we have simulated paths, we can simply use those paths to calculate this expectation. And then we know the sensitivity uh, to uh, ST0 and also uh, C. Uh, let's take a look at the numerical results. So this is experiment where we have, uh, when we increase number of paths and we check the sensitivity, how we, how our error behaves. So we have a delta here, here we have a Viga, we increase number of paths and we check how, uh, how the quality of the results will improve. Uh, you see that now increasing number of paths does not really increase the quality of delta. We reach very good quality uh, already at the low number of paths. And for, for Viga, uh, it is uh, similar, the, this, the, uh, the, the bandwidth, the range of uh, Viga does not really improve by increasing number of paths. Um, yes, and that's, you see that in this case, we are not considering time steps because we assume that we have a, our sensitivities depend only on the stock at the maturity. So we, we, could, sim so we could sample stock at the maturity without doing any time steps. So this is why we don't analyze the results with respect to time steps. Okay, let's take a look at the, the Python code. So in the Python code, uh, we do the following experiment. We have, again, some configuration uh, for initial time is T0. We have a maturity of one. Uh, we have a, a delta and Viga exact. So those are calculated, let me see here. So this is uh, Viga is here, uh, Black Scholes Delta. As I mentioned before, uh, depending on whether we have a call or put option, Delta would change. Viga is the same for call and put. So this is argument is not even used in a function signature here. Uh, and then what we have, we will do the following experiment. So we, we change number of paths. So this is, uh, you define some grid, a vector for number of paths, and we will repeat our experiment where we generate paths for given the same random seed, and then we calculate the expectation uh, or the pathwise delta and pathwise uh, Viga based on the path. So let's take a look what, uh, uh, what the pathwise uh, delta is. Pathwise delta, you see, it is very simple expression. We have uh, only indicator when stock at the maturity is bigger than strike. This is the, it will be a vector of uh, zeros and ones. And then ve that vector is used to calculate the expectation of uh, uh, temp times, and then we have this expression from the slides. So it's a S at the maturity divided initial S, ST0, times the temp, which is the indicator function of our payoff. And then we also have discounting effect. The same for Viga. For Viga, the expression is slightly more complicated with some extra, so extra drift terms, some correction terms. But at the end, is the same. We have a vector at the maturity. We have a logarithm of the vector of the maturity divided by a zero. And then we also end up with the pathwise Viga. So let us uh, take you know, run the code. I did only here until 1,000 paths. So it should finish very soon. So you see that after getting 400 uh, paths, the accuracy rather stays the same. It's, uh, of course, if we have too little paths, like here, then the convergence is really bad. But you can see that after the 500 paths, you are quite OK. And the same for, this is for Viga. Uh, after around 300 paths, 400 paths, you cannot really improve the convergence. Everything seems to be fine. So um, takeaways, pathwise convergence, pathwise sensitivities, 
uh, are very beneficial, especially if you know something about the process or something about the payoff. In the case of European options, I would say this is a recommended way to go for, because you, in European type payoffs, you typically know exactly what the, uh, the payoff is. So once the derivative or sensitivity exists, then we can, you can reuse that information to enhance the quality of your uh, uh, of your sensitivity. On the other hand, a pathwise sensitivity does not require additional reruns like you would have for finite difference. That's also very beneficial because that saves you computational time, uh, evaluation time. That if you have to repeat whole Monte Carlo simulation to get again the bumped or shocked parameter, and then you have to reuse it. And imagine if you have multiple parameters, like you would have uh, ST0, we have also sigma, we have maybe interest rates. For all of those parameters, you will need to perform multiple operations, multiple simulations to get sensitivities. In a pathwise sensitivity, that's uh, very straightforward because everything relies on the paths that you have pre-generated. And that's really very beneficial. Let's take a look at back at the slides. So uh, here we have also another uh, more complicated model. So we here we consider a Heston model, so something we already have model we have discussed before. So again, sensitivity would be derivative of uh, so delta. It's a derivative of a value of a uh, of a, our uh, derivative. No, it's a derivative of derivative of course uh, with respect to st zero. Then we have a, an expectation, and then we have a sensitivity of a payoff with respect to much uh, stock at the maturity. And then we have a derivative of a stock at the maturity with respect to S0. So payoff part, we already have exactly the same how it was for Black Scholes case. And for the Heston model, we can also, we know the dynamics, right? We know the solution. Of course, in this case, V, it is stochastic, right? So this is something to keep in mind. It is not uh, constant. And also the, here we have Brownian motion and this V is stochastic. However, sensitivity, again, if we talk about delta, it is just a uh, distribution, your path simulated at the maturity divided by ST0. So it's exactly the same as we had for Black Scholes case. And for the so then uh, for the delta, we could simply again once we simulated paths for the payoff, once we simulated the paths to generate the value of a payoff, we can reuse those paths for stock to calculate the expected value of a stock at the maturity divided by ST0, and then we have indicator function. So exactly the same how we have done it for Black Scholes. Uh, in the context of VIGA, that's a bit more uh, involved, because what does it mean VIGA in terms of uh, Heston model? In Heston model, we have multiple parameters which correspond, which drive the, the volatility, uh, the variance process, uh, VT. Then the concept of VIGA is a bit different, because then, then every day once we calibrate our model, all the parameters would change. So sensitivity to volatility would be sensitivity to all the model parameters. And that's obviously much more involved than simple uh, Black-Scholes model. Again, if you look at the sensitivity here, the numerical results are very similarly to what we had for Black-Scholes case. Very few paths, we are already getting very good results, and the results, they don't really improve by increasing number of paths. Um, and I think that's the, the main takeaway. Using Hester model, and calculating delta is very similar to using a Black Scholes model without extra effort, without extra computations. Using pathwise sensitivity, we can get uh, good results. Uh, however, it requires a little bit of effort because you need to really calculate those derivatives analytically. And of course, you have to make sure that those derivatives are calculated, calculated correctly. Uh, but obviously, once you do it correctly once, then you can leave it forever. Um, and the other way that how I would do it is that if you have a model for which you would like to calculate those sensitivities, I would always recommend to first perform your finite difference as the base scenario, and then you calculate analytically sensitivities, and then you can compare it to your finite difference. Because it's difficult to make mistake in finite difference because you just repeat your experiment multiple times, but if you calculate your uh, pathwise sensitivity analytically, you can make easily mistake. So how would you know that you made a mistake? Then I always recommend to compare these to each other. And then once they converge, once delta shocks are small and the numbers are very much aligned, then you have, uh, you are feel comfortable that you are certain that the derivations and the results are uh, fine. The final technique that I would like to discuss for computation of sensitivities of computation of the Greeks is the technique called likelihood ratio method. Uh, 
So let's start from the definition. Again, we have a, a value of derivative, which is uh, given as a discounted expected future payoff. So this term here, it is uh, equivalent with an expectation under Q measure of our payoff at the maturity. Actually, we could say here S. This is exactly the same. You see there is a payoff here with times the density DZ. And what we do, we calculate now the sensitivity of our uh, value today because it's discounted future payoff. We calculate the sensitivity uh, with respect to parameter theta. So it's exactly the same as we have done for pathwise and also for a, a finite difference method. So we have here the definition, of course, the uh, discounting goes outside, it's, it's not sensitive. Uh, of course, we don't calculate sensitivity to R right now. That's also possible, but that will be rather trivial in the case of uh, constant interest rates. So we have a derivative here. We have the integral of the payoff uh, of the expected value. And what we do, we interchange operators. We interchange integration with uh, derivative. So you can see that this derivative actually goes into the density. So density typically depends on a parameter theta. Our payoff naturally will not depend on parameter. Typically, if you talk about a payoff value, it depends on a stock of the underlying asset, but does not depend on a model parameter, because that would be uh, rather strange that your payoff would depend on some parameter that you calibrated. Typically, your payoff depends on a stock or different asset that you consider. So, okay, uh, so this is the, the expression we have. Let's continue. So, um, equivalently, what we can write is exactly the same, that except that for this element here, you see that we multiply and divide this expression with uh, uh, density of st. So, this is exactly the same. So, this you can see it cancels out, it's irrelevant. But now what we do, we uh, take uh, denominator, we include here, so it is basically this part here. To a slightly different. You see, this it goes together, and now we have this density here. So uh, you see, it's a payoff times this expression involving densities times the density. So what we can do, we can also now go back to expectation. So then we don't have this dependence on the density here, and then in terms of expectation, we have a value of derivative, uh, the payoff function times this uh, ratio, uh, which is sensitivity. Of a density to parameter divided by density, and actually we can re we can easily recognize that this whole expression is equal to the partial derivative of a log of s uh, of density st. So this is this is why it's called likelihood ratio. We started with the uh, likelihood uh, ratio of this uh, density. We have now the derivative of this density. Of course, this is uh, uh, quite handy once we know the the density uh, for uh, for stock. So once we know the density, we can calculate, of course, the logarithmic transformation, and we calculate the sensitivity to parameter t. Let's take a look how this would look for the Black-Scholes case. So for that, this is the density for the stock process. We have to take a logarithm, and we calculate sensitivity. And this is given in this term. So we see it is actually in, given in closed form. So we have beta x, and then we have divided by st0 uh, sigma squared, and then this beta term is given uh, as follows. And it's the same for the uh, for sigma. So for sigma looks even simpler because we have just a function of sigma. Of course, we have still this dependence on x. And then once we have this expression for, for both, so we have this derivative and we have this derivative, we can substitute here uh, in this way here. Let's see. So overall, once we talk about the likelihood ratio method, and we substitute those uh, derivatives into the expression that we had for the likelihood ratio, uh, we end up with the following expression. So it's a expected value of a payoff times this uh, beta function of st. And the same for vega. So it is very similar. So we have a payoff function, and then we have still, again, the, the relation with this beta function. Uh, if you compare this approach to pathwise, uh, from the number, from the let's say derivation perspective and computational perspective, that's less attractive, right? Because we see we have this maximum we have to calculate our payoff uh, before we had to calculate on indicator function, which was uh, uh, simpler. Uh, now, if we compare the the sensitivity in terms of numerical results, so if you compare numerical uh, convergence, you see that the black line is the one which corresponds to the uh, likelihood estimator. Red line is the pathwise. And this, this is for delta approach, the delta calculation. This is Vega calculation. So again, uh, pathwise is better. It converges better. There is much less 
uh, volatility, let's say, uh, compared to uh, Vega. Uh, but this is just a method I would like to introduce um, to show you how it is uh, done. Uh, but indeed, personally, I would also consider the case for pathwise sensitivities. As you have seen, pathwise sensitivities allows us to compute also deltas for the uh, uh, for the Black Scholes model. Also for Heston, we had this analytically, so without uh, too much uh, effort. Uh, this additional calculation of a payoff function it doesn't look uh, super attractive to me. And also the numerical experiments show that uh, pathwise it's is overperforming, is much better, much better in terms of convergence compared to the likelihood ratio estimates. However, it's good to keep in mind uh, because you never know what kind of model you would have to deal with. It could be that's more suitable, especially if you have this logarithm um, of your uh, uh, of your density, it's given in cloth form, then you can indeed calculate this uh, more efficiently. But in practice, once you talk about Hestel model, once you have to calculate those derivatives, that is very impractical. That's not going to work very well because for Hestel model, we don't know the density analytically. It is given only in terms of Fourier transformation. So of course, the sensitivity to parameters, it will be much more difficult to get even for delta compared to the uh, to the uh, pathwise. So in the pathwise, we had it in closed form. Uh, given the paths here, we will need to know something about the density and we don't know anything. So likelihood ratio method is not going to perform very well once we talk about uh, more advanced uh, processes.